All right, everybody. So this week we're going to be releasing an episode from our Patreon vault. Not even all of it, actually, just a, a little over half, probably. And you can get the full episode of this at our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash superhero stuff pod. So without further ado, here we go. Yo, we're here behind the paywall. <laughs> <laughs> Hidden right gems up. from Batman mm -hmm. Comics. That's Detective right. Detective Comics and all the rest. Detective uh, Comics, Batman, Shadow of the Bat, Gotham Knights, all the good stuff. Legends of the Dark Knight, not to be forgotten. But yes, we are going over Batman Hidden Gems since we had Superman woo. Hidden Gems. And I decided to kind of split this up a little bit. This will be on single issue stories, one shots, mm. graphic novels, ones where you can just pick it all up in one collection. You don't have to dig through DC Universe or reading lists or DC Wiki just to figure out how to collect the entire arc, especially if it's oh, a man. monster like that Batman shit is Eternal. so complicated sometimes. I know, I know. I, um, I was reading Bruce Wayne Fugitive and they do not have it at all. It's like not even in the right order in DC Universe, and it's not oh, even God. DC Universe's fault because they didn't even put Fugitive, the name with the title, they, they like the name with the arc on every issue. So you have oh, to dig God. through everything. It's weird. But anyway, we don't have to deal with that bullshit. I so. think DC Universe app is like the infinite or whatever. They're probably yeah. waiting on funds for an update because it, it feels like it needs an update, and it's they're probably just waiting for all the discovery shit to be figured out or something. Cause it's Maybe. man, yeah. it is like, it's good enough, but it's still got some issues, you know? Yeah. And this one, I don't know if it's ever going to be fixed unless they have a human being go through it because it's like, they <laughs> did collect everything. Bless you. They did collect Thank everything. You. That's part of fugitive, which has it on the title is just that for whatever reason, they didn't put the name of the arc on every single issue. And oh my apparently God, yeah. in the different collections on the trade paperbacks, they didn't even do that either. So it's it was a hell of a thing. Where I'm just like, this is one of the worst experiences I've ever had trying to basically read an entire arc when it should have just been in order. You know, Batman 1 through right. 30, 30 issues. There we go. Right. right I wonder right. if they did the new 52. But I digress. Anyway, single issue hidden gems. We'll do hidden gem story arcs another time. But We've kind of been somewhat critical of the top 10 lists, the top, the greatest stories, the greatest comics of all time, as we see here, Empire, IGN, Slash Film, CBR. And I don't know what this last one is. Dan put this together. But there's always like these top 10 lists, like, you know, like the top films of all time with fucking um, Godfather, Sizz and Kane. Sizz and Kane, stuff. always at number one and shit. Like, <laughs> right. all right, bro. You know what I mean? Like, you just can't yeah. go by these lists. It's like they're making them for an alien that's never, yeah. you know, like, I don't know why I say that, but like somebody that's just come to Earth or I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> right, right. Continue. It's just like, I've, you've heard of all these, even if you haven't even, even if you haven't gotten the chance to read them, it's just like, all right, this is, it's the same shit over and over again. Um, this one's from CBR is not, as uh not as basic as what i would think since it, is, since it doesn't have frank miller's stuff uh on here the top one the top two are actually grant morrison which is cool mm -hmm. That's uh, awesome. though i wouldn't necessarily put those on there but uh i'd say this is the most basic list which is on empire we've got the dark knight oh, returns yeah. year one jeff Loeb's long halloween and dark victory the killing joke Gotham Central. Batman's barely in Gotham Central, so I don't know if I would count that, but I, I get it. It's part of the same world. Court of Owls, Hush, Arkham Asylum, Earth One. Sometimes Earth One's on, on the list, and sometimes it's not and stuff, but definitely the the others, especially Earth the One's stuff, good, Gotham but stuff. like, I don't know. It wasn't like the greatest. Yeah, it wasn't like totally blown away. Yeah, I don't think I put it on a list like this. I yeah. put it above Hush, though. <laughs> I would, too. Yeah, that's, that's my hot take on this one. <laughs> So, I mean, I get it. I get why these are on this kind of list, but mm -hmm. it's just like, I don't know. It's just, you know, it's it, they're kind of made for people just getting into comics. I yeah. guess they, they like the movies and they want to dig deeper. So I, I, I kind of get it. I'm not trying to hate too hard. Hell, yeah, I mean, I get it, too. You know, you know like, yeah, the Frank Miller stuff is so influential on everything. It's, it's the point where like, OK, Dark Knight Returns Batman. 
They did it with Affleck. And then year one Batman, they've done it with Pattinson. And obviously they've had different influences on the previous ones. It'd be refreshing if the next take was completely divorced from the Dark Knight Returns and year one. I mean, obviously there'll be and some small Halloween And long Halloween. Uh, yeah, but just Frank Miller entirely, that would be interesting because I'm just like, all right, we already got Dark Knight Returns type Batman. We already got year one type Batman. All right, can we finally get the quote unquote hairy chested love god of the 70s from Neil Adam? <laughs> they, that's, that's how Grant Morrison described uh, hairy you know, chested that, love god. Where he's like bare chested, fencing against Ross Ghoul. We don't necessarily need that in the next take, but like it would be different, you know? So it would definitely be stuff. different. Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. So I decided to kind of go through and take a look at like these are kind of the typical ones that are listed as like the top 10 that are single issue or one shot. So we got The Killing Joke, Arkham Asylum, A Serious House on Serious Earth, and then sometimes The Man Who Laughs, uh, which is Mm -hmm. Ed Brubaker, Doug Mankey's take on Batman's first meeting with the Joker. I love that font. Again, I'll say it again. That's a great, fun Batman font on that on that one. Uh, the Man Who Laughs. On oh, The Man Who Laughs, yeah. They're all good, yeah. but I, I I really like that one. Specifically on the Batman font or the Man Who Laughs font? Batman font. Yeah, it's pretty good. I like it. Yeah, it's like a little art deco and fun and classic and yeah, it's nice. Yeah, they're all, cool. But they're all good for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like you in the sense of like, I get the significance of these stories. I've read each one multiple times. I don't hate them, but... I just wouldn't put these in my personal top 10. So mm-hmm. we can go one by one, you know, killing joke is kind of the big, <laughs> it's the basic bitch. Number one, Joker story. Number you know? one, a number one. <laughs> like, I love Grant Morrison's take on it. Like, and it, you know, that's where I got the idea too, of like, it's Alan Moore trying to write the last Batman story. Yeah. Kind of. I mean, I guess it could work that way. Like, the part that I don't like about Grant Morrison's interpretation is the idea that, like, it's called the killing joke because he kills him at the end. I'm like, eh, I don't think that that's what happens at all at the end. But that's, well, that's my It's all about, like, the laughing stops abruptly from panel to panel and all that yeah. bullshit. I mean, go back. If you're listening to this and you're interested in that, it's an old Fat Man Beyond episode when it was Bat- Fat Man on Batman. Mm-hmm. The Kevin Smith podcast with, with Grant Morrison. It's a great episode. It's you know, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's it's great to hear the insight from Morrison on his own stuff. But for this one, I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't really like that interpretation. It's fantastic art though by Brian yeah. Bolin. That's like yeah. the definitive Joker and stuff. Like Neil Adams has a pretty good Joker, but I think Boland is like basically elevated even further. And so that's mm-hmm. it's it's a great like great art. I stick by the original issue of it. They like they there's a recolored version. And it just does not have the same charm. Oh today. yeah! Every time they do th- do that kind of shit, it's never as good. Yeah, no. So, I mean, this is one of the most highly influential takes on the Joker. Tim Burton's favorite comic, you know, influential <laughs> on Keith Ledger's, you know, the one bad day stuff to push you into insanity. Influential on Joaquin Phoenix with the whole failed stand up comic. Even influential on Gotham, where Cameron Monaghan's version literally says the one bad day line, and. It really does encapsulate how like Batman and the villains represent different ways of responding to pain and, and trauma. You know, Batman goes one way in terms of like, I don't want other people to feel this pain again. And Joker goes the other way, being like, I want everyone to feel the same pain that I felt right in, in a way. So I do like that dichotomy, but I've never really I've never really read it and be like, oh, this is the ultimate Batman versus Joker story of all time. Like it was kind of a similar reaction I had to year one where I, I was like, well, it's, it's good, but that's it (laughs) i thought Mm -hmm. there would be more to it and maybe it's been kind of soured over time you know alan moore himself doesn't really like it and then (laughs) you know he hates everything (laughs) but he hates everything but like it's it's his on his own comic it's not on like an adaptation or something and there's kind of this implied sexual assault on barbara that just feels icky even though like yeah obviously joker's the villain and stuff but uh, there's that and this Grant Morrison theory and then it's kind of solid by the animated movie where it's just like dude they fucked up on that, that one just up. make something 28 minutes or whatever like they try to extend yeah. it yeah they, they always fuck up with that shit man yeah exactly it's, and it was Bruce Tim, Kevin Conroy Mark Hamill and it turns out it's not always gold you know yeah. it's, it's not always gold especially it was Brian Azzarello on 
on the script writing duties instead of like someone like Paul Dini or even just literally just scripting out what's in the comic and stuff. And I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Azarello's Batman in general. So it's kind of no surprise there for that, but there's just, there's a lot of bad associations to the killing joke now. And the whole one bad day thing was cool in 88, but now it just, I feel like it's been kind of, it's become basic now. It's like, all right, yeah, I get it. Oh, everybody's yeah. Read this. yeah. Like I get, yeah. I get the point. All right. One bad day. Insanity, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't, I, it's, it's time for a new, type of joker story is kind of what it feels like Mm -hmm. uh, at this point though in 1988 i'm sure it was it was more groundbreaking but right eh, it's again it's it's i don't hate it i don't think it's uh the worst thing ever but it is it does feel overrated to me uh so the middle one arkham asylum grant morrison great similar thing with the art great unique dark art from mckean complete opposite from what we got from from Bolin. Great concept. Batman's trapped inside of Arkham. Obviously inspirational for the video game. When it comes to the story, and I'm... Mm -hmm. Here's what I figured out, because I'm just like, I do like Grant Morrison. I just don't know why I don't necessarily put Grant Morrison's stories on the top of my list. And I think the part of it is that I love Morrison's characterizations. I love the ideas. But I feel a lot of the times, especially with this one... It, like the symbolism and the metaphors and stuff, they're great, but almost there's, it's almost like there's too much of it to the point where I'm like, I don't think the stories hit emotionally or stick with me as much in comparison. I mean, there's stuff like All Star Superman where there's definitely an emotional core to it. Mm-hmm. And then we've got things here where, like, all right, you kind of expect a Batman in a diehard type situation, like the video game. Yeah. And instead, we got Batman stabbing a shard of glass through his hand be okay with the villain getting his throat cut in front of him. And it ends with him releasing all of the Arkham inmates at the end. I'm like, that's just weird to me. And I get that there's, you know, hidden meanings behind it, but it's like it's, dreamscape, I guess. I mean, this yeah. is, I mean, I see this comic as like, it's, it's in Batman's mind. Yeah, I don't really I see this as like it. really happening. Right. It, the artwork's so dreamy yeah. or nightmarish and, yeah, this is not to be read um, literally, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think it's one of those things where the concept is so good, you expect something that's closer to the video game. And then what you don't realize is what is delivered, which is something that's a lot more of a nightmare dreamscape of, you know, what if Batman was kind of more buddy buddy Swift, who's, you know, who's in the who's in the asylum by the end, like mm-hmm. that type of thing. And it's, it's weird to read it on first read with without the dreamscape part in mind you know yeah uh, yeah which is not what i had in mind when i first read it when i first read it i'm just like this sounds like an awesome concept and then i <laughs> and then i don't know i was like maybe 13 14 at the time oh, when I read you it. weren't ready for it no. man you were a little young i guess yeah i was like what <laughs> uh-huh so uh yeah again I, I do like it i do appreciate it but it's 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 i i really love grant morrison's batman characterization in general, but that's more so from the Batman work later on, you know, Batman R.I.P. and mm-hmm. Batman Incorporated. Not as much with this one, but I, I get it. This is Grant Morrison's first take on Batman. So got to get got to give some slack on that. He put the stake in the ground, too, or I, yeah. I think like he really like put the full Morrison in, into this one. <laughs> like yeah. it's, it's really it feels like Grant Morrison unfiltered, like mm-hmm. right out the gate, like he wasn't holding back. Yeah, yeah, and it gets that way later on with the uh, the arc. <laughs> like, there's the return of Bruce Wayne arc. We'll talk about this, like the general arc uh, that he that he's got. But the return of Bruce Wayne arc is I I've, I reread it for the second time, and I'm I'm still lost at the end. I'm like, okay, I need a wiki summary on what the fuck just happened here because there's mm-hmm. way too much shit going on. So if I'm like that with it, I can only imagine what some of the you know I mean a lot of the readers are like. Maybe I think you you I, I haven't done this either yet, but with Arkham Asylum, there's probably like you gotta go into like his occult ideas he's trying <laughs> to throw in there. You know what I mean? Like right. usually that's that's grasping, but mm-hmm. with Morrison, it's not. No, no. If if anything, you kind of need to know that stuff to understand yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Like that's that's like a kind of a backing for a bunch of shit. So I mean, like when he wrote the invisibles, you know the invisibles? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I haven't read that, but I know of them. I read the first trade. It's is great, but 
like apparently it turns into like the comic itself and his writing it and everything involved with it uh is a ritual in and of itself and the reader starts to become part of it or something it's like it's wild dude huh. like he's it, it it is i don't i don't think i got quite that far but that's a, again like a, like a hundred percent morrison it's oh, dude yeah it's good i ch- oh, i gotta check it out especially with uh <laughs> the comment morrison made on the matrix oh like, yeah it's he's basically like, the invisibles i'm like yeah all right i'm down nah, for it. it's there's the matrix <laughs> there's a lot of differences is, i'm sure <laughs> yeah there, there's there's some similarities for sure yeah there really are um but the matrix i don't think there's like kung fu and like hacking like the hacking part and in invisibles oh yeah I, i'm i'm definitely prepared for something that's a lot more even more insane and less like less mainstream stuff and the most mainstream stuff about the matrix is the action of course yes exactly yeah so but yeah, i mean as far as being like kind of you know whacked out and about bigger ideas and mm-hmm. occult shit it's all in in the invisibles so yeah that's cool I'll for sure out. yeah uh and the last one here is the man who laughs which it's really on here because it, it's a, a modern day version of batman meeting joker for the first time and it, it sort of carries over the batman year one type of conceit of you know gordon's narration and batman's narration written in cursive all that type of stuff it serves its purpose i can see you know why it's recommended and stuff but it's a similar thing too or like it's kind of a nice safe batman faces off against joker thing uh, but i also kind of feel like it's been done better at the same time so it's again it's still good i still like it i've still read it multiple times but in terms of a top story i'm like eh, i don't know so i also think there's a difference between like stories that are most impactful versus stories that are actually like really good you know mm-hmm. like yeah death in the family one of the biggest stories in batman history and killing off jason todd is the story actually that great Ugh. i mean the whole thing like the whole 25 <laughs> percent of it was based off of what people voted you know? i know yeah <laughs> yeah you the know in like if Jason's Todd survived, then what the hell was this going to be about? It was just going to be like, well, I could have lost Jason. (laughs) Like it would have been a story about something that almost happened. It wouldn't necessarily Mm -hmm. have been about like, it kind of had to become one where he did die in order for it to be considered a must read. But uh, you know, the entire, the entire last issue is at the mercy of people's phone calls. And that just doesn't seem, it, it feels weird to see that as a, as a top thing. It's a major significant part in Batman history. And I think you've brought this up before to me too, is where it's just, it seems like a lot of people's like, you must read this comic. It's more because of like, Oh, something significant happened in it, but not necessarily. It's a great story. Yeah. They, in some ways. It's they've added something big to the Batman mythos at large. Yeah, but definitely. at the same time, doesn't necessarily mean that the story is crackerjack, <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, right. Mm-hmm. You so, know? so yeah, I, I think that's definitely true, and maybe not just for Batman, but for for other stories. But for our purposes today, definitely for the Batman stuff. And so I decided, all right, let me gather some hidden gems, uh, starting with the single issue stuff that I like better than these three. These are stories I tried to find that are centered on Bruce Wayne and Batman, and showcase different aspects of the characters and bring out different emotions. I tried to find emotional stories too, ones that I can I like that. I, yeah, ones that I'm sure that you would like and ones that I um, you know, hidden gems that stick with me. Not ones where I'm just like, oh yeah, that was good, <laughs> you know, later on. Dude, so I gotta tell you, man, in like a year or two, I feel like this is gonna be a release from the vault episode. Cause this is the exact kind of it. shit I yeah. search for on YouTube. Mm-hmm. That's why I did it for Superman. Yeah. So yeah. um even though our views are pretty low but <laughs> on that one, but uh, good for a Superman episode. <laughs> but it was good, good enough, I guess. But like yeah. you know, um, yeah, this is the exact kind of thing I searched for. I started with video games, and now I do it for all kinds of shit. So yeah, yeah, because it's it's like all right, let's get away from the basic ass list of like read year one of the Dark Knight Returns. I'm like, all right, but what if you've already read those? Yeah, you know? let's move on move past on. that one. All Star really is great, yeah. you know, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's listen let's uh read some other ones yeah yeah so i really wanted ones that are like solid demonstrations of like this is what the character is about in some way and ones that are centered on batman i did not pick like villain centric ones or sidekick centric ones because it didn't feel right to do one that was 
like I really like this one by Paul Dini where Tim Drake's Robin is held hostage by the Joker, but Batman's in like two pages. Of it. Oh so yeah, okay. Called the top ten Batman hidden gem. I'm like, yeah, I'll save that for like a Joker thing, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. Just wanted to announce that I have a new podcast called Japanese to English Translation. In this first season, it will be ten episodes each season. First season will be dropping soon, much sooner than I'm on a recon. The co-host for this one will be Mike Torres. If you saw the ranking, every Superman video game two-parter we did here on Superhero Stuff You Should Know, you have seen Mike before. So yes, if you like video games, if you've been interested in Japanese ever, we're going to be talking a lot about just Japan in general, Japanese cultural differences as well. And we also are going to have a lot of talk about 90s video game magazines such as Electronic Gaming Monthly, a.k.a. EGM. So stay tuned for that. So please be on the lookout for Gaming Gaiden Podcast coming soon. Ellen, in 15 seconds, what is Nice Games Club? It's our game dev podcast. Steven, help! Game mechanics, accessibility, art and animation, level design, prototyping. Everything that goes into making video games. How's that, Mark? Nice. Listen to Nice Games Club wherever you get your podcasts or at nicegames.club. Need some adventure in your life? What Mad Universe is a podcast where two guys delve into the history of sci-fi, fantasy, and horror, and the impact it's had on pop culture. Everything's the same politically, but we have ray guns. The the actual motive isn't to explore something that's, quote, yeah. scientifically possible. or. But neither is Star Wars, and I know there's Shh. arguments about that, but I would definitely consider Star Wars science fiction. You haven't it's, read Dune! You have, no, I haven't. You can never be the Kwisatz Haderach. What Mad Universe on the HyperX Podcast Network. What's that? majestically cresting the horizon as it makes its way into port. Why, it's the brand new HyperX Armada monitors, mounts, and arms. Both the HyperX Armada 25 and 27 gaming monitors come bundled with a sturdy HyperX Armada mount and arm. If you need every split second of advantage when gaming, the Full HD Armada 25 and its 240Hz refresh rate are for you. If you like to soak in the graphical majesty of your gaming, you'll be eyeing the Quad HD Armada 27 with an 165 hertz refresh rate. Set sail for HyperX.com or Amazon.com to start making your display armada. If you're a shrewd shopper, it's about to be your favorite time of the year. HyperX will be running massive sales for the holiday season. Get up to 50% off some of our most popular products like the Ultra Comfy Cloud 2 headset, the tough, responsive Alloy Origins mechanical keyboard, and the fan favorite Quadcast USB microphone. Sales will be going on at all major e-tailers, but be sure to head to HyperX.com and sign up for the newsletter to get the scoop on the biggest deals. Happy Holidays from HyperX. Hey there, this is Andrew Sellen, better known to you as Mr. Penn and the Ventriloquist on Gotham. And this is Mr. Scarface, and if you know what's good for you, you'll listen to Suther House Podcast. Get it? Let's get to it. Number 10, Down to the Bone, Batman Annual number 10 from 1986. It says, The Triumph of Hugo Strange. You probably figured I was going to have a Hugo Strange story somewhere here. You're the number one Hugo Strange fan I've ever met. Yeah. So writers Doug Mensch, art uh, by Dennis Cohen, uh, Alfredo Alcala, letters by John Costanza, colors by Adrian Roy. So a uh, friend of the podcast, John Hefner, uh, who's guested a few times with us, I kind of have him to thank for introducing me to this one through his blog many years ago. It's before we met and stuff. I was just reading and he was bringing up all the different Hugo Strange stories. I'm like, I read the premise for this one. I'm like, I got to read this one. Do you so, think he knows more than you about Batman? Um, he could I, challenge you at least. He could probably challenge. Yeah, he could probably yeah. challenge me at least. I, I can definitely say he's more of an authority on on Two Face. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, that that's like, like his shit. Yeah, <laughs> his, yeah. Uh, is his shit. But I think what I've also realized in recent in recent months or so actually is, is how much I'm not just a fan of the universe, but I'm a fan of the character, like the specific character of Bruce Wayne. Like many people are just like, I really like Batman, but their favorite character is, you know, is two Face, like with John or, or is the Joker or is Mr. Freeze or something like it is not necessarily Batman being the top. And I realized like my favorite 
is actually Bruce. You know, that's probably that's one, nice. That's, that's probably cool. another reason why I'm not super into Batman Beyond because he's not the main character. I see. Yeah, I mean, this is like we talked about in the other episode where people, uh, like back at well, people that watch Power Rangers, some of them, some of them watch him for the villains. Yeah, they watch him for the monster. Definitely. Uh, Definitely. So yeah, that 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 uh, that person exists for sure. Mm-hmm. So yeah, for, for me, I'm like, I like Hugo Strange, but just having Hugo Strange in it doesn't automatically equal a great story to me. Man, like, I asked a coworker good. what his favorite Ninja Turtles character was, and he said Krang. <laughs> you know, the walking brain guy in the fucking suit <laughs> like it's, it's cool i mean i get it. i kind of get it but like man i'm there yeah. for the heroes bro yeah like <laughs> so i'm Make that our tagline definitely i'm a bruce wayne guy through and through okay, on this, okay which is probably yeah. why i've never been super into ones where he's not batman you know like mm. right now they've got like oh there's a black batman with jace fox and stuff i'm like that's cool uh, that's really awesome. I have not read a single issue so far, not because I don't want to, but because I'm <laughs> it's just like, cause you're racist. <laughs> hey, I didn't really read the Dick Grayson ones that much either. <laughs> uh, I'm at least equal opportunity. <laughs> against, yeah, yeah. Gotta against, be Bruce. Uh, non Bruce. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I did tease this. I think Jeffrey on our patrons, Jeffrey got the comic for this after I, I, I brought it up in the, the make the bat fleck movie coverage. I said that maybe they, had some inspiration from this comic or this comic sort of illustrates kind of what they were going for with the Deathstroke movie. So here's what it is. Uh, you know, I'm a big Hugo Strange fan. And one of the big reasons mm -hmm. why is that before Nightfall, before Hush, before all this other bullshit of these other villains trying to break Batman, Hugo Strange was the one to try to psychologically break him and stuff and okay. really get to his core and we covered some of it in the strange apparitions arc it was really steve Englehart who comes in and he reimagines this mad scientist guy as a character who is fascinated by batman to the point of wanting to take over his life take over his identity literally become batman and you know Englehart resolves it kind of in a neat little bow where like rupert thorne just kills him and then that's it but it's really doug mensch here who decides you know what let's take this way further of like what would happen if a Batman villain found out that Bruce Wayne was Batman. And so there's always that trope in superheroes where it's like, there's the fear of like, oh, if I tell people my secret identity or let people in on the secret, they're going to come after me. They're going to come after the people I love. I can't have that happen. And so that's always like, it's always something they're afraid of. And, and we very rarely see it come to fruition to the point that we see in this one. So cool. Hugo Stranger's back for revenge and he comes for everything in this story. So it's called down to the bone and Hugo strange single-handedly causes Bruce to lose ownership of the Wayne foundation and his wealth. He induces Alfred to have a stroke. He frames Batman for crimes. He buys Wayne Manor from out from under him and takes all the possessions and has him lose custody of Jason Todd. He is out to take everything from Batman down to the bone. As the title says, that's cool, man. This is an annual too. So this is, they, they really try to put their, their, some of their best stories in an annual, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's yeah. a longer it's a longer issue. So don't think like, holy shit, how does this resolve in like twenty two pages? It, it is it's much longer uh, mm -hmm. than that. So he Bruce is alone, stripped of all his resources, all his wealth. He's living on the streets with just a bat suit and thirty seven dollars in his pocket. This and artwork has, is cool, dude. Yeah, uh, I think this is Dennis Cowan on this one. I like uh, it. But, uh, Bruce has to rely solely on his wits to take his life back from the man who stole it and endure t quote till he drops if need be, literally down to the bone. And so nice Batman without riches solely relying on his genius against a man who's out to break him and has taken pretty much nearly everything from him on this. So does uh, he take Alfred bro? I'll be very upset if he took Alfred. Uh, he does induce Alfred to have a stroke, but he does not, you know, this is okay. <laughs> they, they don't want to go that far. Okay, this, good. It is. This is now this one is number 10, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. so I'm, not the I'm, greatest, I'm, but I'm it's pretty this. good. I'm listening to this because the setup is fantastic. You know, what I just described and stuff. I just feel like because of the fact that it is in an annual and it is not a full arc, that kind of lets it down a little bit. It, oh. it, it does have a feeling where it's just like, all right, I got a few pages here. Uh, let's wrap this up. <laughs> you know, oh, if it man. had extended, you know, if it was like this, this concept could have easily been at least four issues, if not more, you mm -hmm. know? I'd rather read 13 issues of this compared to Hush, you know, but <laughs> yeah, true. it is. It looks it, cooler already. I mean, yeah, yeah, the, the artwork is really cool. 
it definitely gets copied in some ways later. You know, you can kind of tell there's a bit of the Dark Knight Rises influence on it with the whole like taking Wayne Manor and taking Wayne Foundation from him and taking his wealth. So it's kind of cool that that kind of made it into the movie. The motivation is just good old fashioned revenge here. We don't have some bullshit from Nightfall where Bane just dreams about a bat and decides he's going to break <laughs> Batman. We don't have Hush being like, well, your dad's saved by mom and I hate my mom. And so I'm jealous of you and your life and I want to break you. <laughs> Like, no, it's just pure, like, you're Batman, I want your life, I take your life from you, and that's it. Right, right, right. So Yeah, that's uh, simple's best, man. Yeah, and it, it, it works, you know, it's the ultimate Hugo Strange story to me. It sums up what makes Batman Batman, is that no matter what you throw at him, no matter what you take from him, he's not going to give up, and he's always going to come back. See, so, now I want a Hugo Strange from Matt Reeves, the Batman, too. See? You see? know? I just convinced you, yeah. <laughs> like, like, this, like him hitting at Hush, I'm just, remember, like, it's like, uh, but if he changed that Hush to Hugo... Yeah, now we're. Talking. I'd be so much more interested. Yeah, you know, if if the the story, if there's like, hey, we're gonna have a movie where Batman, like the villain's out to break Batman, everyone's gonna be like, oh, they're gonna do Bane again, and they're like, no, it's gonna be Hugo Strange. Some people are gonna be like, who? Some other people are gonna be like, eh, I don't know, but I'm gonna be excited because I'm gonna be pretty sure that Reeves is looking at this type of story. Like, if they're making of... a goddamn Morbius movie, bro, I mean, <laughs> what just who gives a Morbid fuck? Time. Well, Morbin died. <laughs> I gotta hand it to the internet for making the funniest shit, dude. That, <laughs> that shit is so fucking funny, man. The fucking Morbin. Died. You've seen the 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 video it comes from, right? <laughs> no, I haven't. I've just seen the dumb memes. Okay, it, it's him facing off against Venom, and Venom's like, "Time to die," and he's like, "No, it's Morbin time." <laughs> <laughs> And my, the People, funniest part to me is Venom yeah. panics. I'm like, you're fucking Venom. You're up against a little <laughs> vampire dude. And Venom's dude, like, shit. <laughs> I would love a Venom versus Morbius movie, man. They like, should do that. Oh, like, that'd be so cool, dude. And hopefully make it better. Just have fucking <laughs> Circus direct that one and save the save Morbius. Like they were saying, um, <laughs> there were there were so many comments on Twitter and and Reddit saying, you guys need to stop fucking talking about the movie because if you keep talking about it they're gonna make another <laughs> one <laughs> maybe they will just be better what an interesting like you know afterlife the movie has i know now, right? right yeah <laughs> it's, it's so bad the internet has to turn it into something it really is like not even death could kill it bro i mean <laughs> box office death it's the undead it's an undead vampire of a movie. It's yeah. it's it's interest. I haven't seen it, but now I neither have I. I've heard some people say like it's shitty, but if you go in with low expectations, it's all right. You know, yeah. like it's a, it's an okay uh, watch. Let us know in the comments how you thought about Morbius. Yeah, <laughs> if any all of right. you have actually seen it, if you, probably somebody in our. I'm sure yeah. behind the paywall. So uh, that is number ten, down to the bone, Batman Annual number uh, number ten in 1986. So that's number ten. Nice. Awesome. Uh, number nine is Fatal Wish, in Batman 430. Nice uh, name. Writer is Jim Starlin. Pencils Jim Aparo. Inks Mike DiCarlo. Letters and colors again by Costanza and Roy. So uh, as it says here, somewhere below there lurks a madman with a rifle and a secret the Batman dare not face. Somewhere below. Is the fatal wish nice good name like the purple sky background oh yeah looks uh, good with true. the blue mm -hmm. it's great and, and rob ailing mentioned this one uh the first time he came on is like the story that got him into batman and uh, uh -huh. i was like which one is that and then I, I looked at it again i'm like oh it's this one fantastic nice 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 that's so, cool i want to uh, read this one it is the team up of jim starlin and uh uh Apar jim aparo who they're mainly famous for a death in the family, but they have so many better stories than a death in the fucking family. And that Spectre run, right? Uh, I don't know if Is that that's... Starlin. Oh, I'm thinking of somebody else. I think and I, I don't know that they one up. that those two specifically did uh, the Spectre, but I do know that they did. Uh, you know, they did this one. So did Starlin invented Thanos or something? Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, that's that's what that's what I'm thinking. And he's kind of underrated for his contributions to Batman because it's mainly people being like, oh, it's Death in the Family. And like, eh, Death in the Family was mainly editorial <laughs> writing that, if you think about it, in terms of mm. like, we need a big event to kill off Robin. And Star Wars just happened to be the guy <laughs> writing right. it at the time. So right, right, right. It wasn't really, it wasn't really Starlin's idea, I feel like. Uh, so Fatal Wish, this is unfortunately very relevant to our times there's a mass shooter on a rooftop killing oh my people. god yeah okay so batman goes in to stop him before the police 
you know, before the SWAT team goes in and guns him down because he basically wants to save everyone. And as the killer yells out that he wishes everyone were dead, Batman sort of has his own flashbacks as he's going in to a time where his father, Thomas Wayne, hit him as a boy accidentally. Uh, well, not necessarily accidentally, but like in just a, a moment of passion, do you say, where he's just already pissed about things going on and Bruce being a little shit. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, my uh, mom hit me once, but I, in my memory, I was a being a little shit. Like yeah. I have absolutely no trauma from that because I know it was my fault. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. a slap. She slapped yeah. me. Yeah. But Bruce yeah. is pissed about his father hitting him and, you know, okay. tells tells his mom, oh, I wish daddy were dead and stuff. And Mars like, you don't mean that. And he's like, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. And Thomas, like, apologizes to Bruce. He's like, you know what? Let's take you to the movies. And obviously that led to their deaths. Oh, so man. you can see where this is going and why it's called Fatal Wish is that, you know, Starlin writes, quote, deep within the depths of the subconscious, a little boy cries out, I'm sorry, daddy. I didn't mean it. Mm -hmm. So very emotional one it's this is more if the if down to the bone was about the uh, perseverance of batman then nice. this is about the tragedy you know mm, okay good mm -hmm. what wants him from day to day so that's cool that's number nine the fatal wish uh number eight gotham knights number 32 this is a great cover this is uh, cool we have grandfather Clark. Clark. yeah uh bruce wayne on one side batman on the other writer is devin grayson pencils roger robinson inks john floyd Bill Oakley and John Workman on letters and colors by Gloria Vasquez. Uh, so in contrast to the last one, which is like the tragic tearjerker one, this is the feel good Batman story. Oh, nice. So, I like those. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's collected in the greatest Batman stories ever told uh, volume one with the Alex Ross cover, but it's, it's very simple, very poignant. It's basically a day in the life of Bruce Wayne as a philanthropist by day and Batman at night. But instead of like, you know, oh, there's a killer or the loose or that type of stuff, or these people died and I'm haunted by that. It's more of, it's more about the good that he does in Gotham City and the impact that he makes and and Bruce basically being at his peak. He's being the ultimate philanthropist and hero to the city in both That's identities. Cool. Uh, it's the main argument we actually used. We used a lot of this comic in the uh, argument that we had against the idea about how Bruce doesn't use his money to help Gotham. Like a lot of the comic examples we had were literally pulled from this one issue by Devin Grayson here. That's cool. So uh, yeah, it's less of a drama, more of a day in the life type of thing of Batman at his peak. And you could also arguably read this as like the final Batman story, even though it's not. Oh, as, nice. Like, this is, this is Batman at his pure peak where like he is a hero to everybody. He has the bat family. He has balance between Bruce Wayne and Batman. He has friends, you know, you, you, you know, put, Put on the piano solo at the end credits of The Batman as you read this. You can kind of, it's hard not to imagine this as like a sort of a poignant ending to like a final Pattinson movie or something, you know? So, yeah, that'd be cool. It is, it's kind of another, I sort of see it as like another way to sort of end the mythos is just like, oh, he's always going to be Batman. It's just, he doesn't have to be so fucking tortured about his parents all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You show somebody m moving on. You know, yeah. like it, it, it affected you. It, it changed your life forever. But you also moved on from it. That's also part of the story. Yeah, it's part of the mythos. Mm -hmm. Should be anyway. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is number. Sorry, I just had to look at something. This is number eight. Yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. number eight, twenty-four seven. All right. Next one, seven. My beginning and my probable end. Mm, nice name. That's yes. cool. Detective Comics number 574 from 1987. Writer is Mike Barr, art by Alan Davis, who I really like. Mm -hmm. Inks by Paul Neary, letters by Richard Starkings, and colors by Adrian Roy again. So another one I read in the greatest Batman stories ever told collection. So uh, Barr and Davis are an underrated team. Uh, I think they did this. They did year two. <laughs> the more, the more, the more uh, famous for year two where Batman is slinging around his gun and teaming up with Joe Chill to fight the Reaper and everyone's just like, this is weird because it is. Um, mm -hmm. This is a much better story. Okay. So Batman brings a wounded Jason Todd to Leslie Tompkins clinic. Mind you, this is before death in the family. So this is weirdly, you know, very foreshadowing here. Yeah. Um, and we essentially get flashbacks of Bruce's journey to becoming Batman intercut with Leslie trying to understand why Bruce chose to become this Avenger of the Night out of all things that he could have done uh, to cope with his parents' deaths and stuff. So uh, the title 
that you like, my beginning, my probable end. It's actually a reference to another solid story that's not on here, but it's pretty good, uh, which is There Is No Hope in Crime Alley in 1976. Okay. Uh, that was from Dennis O'Neill that introduced Leslie Tompkins, introduced the title or the name of Crime Alley and stuff. And um, in that story, she's like, you know, why do you go to Crime Alley? And, and Batman's like, it's, it's a reminder of my beginning and my probable end. Okay. So he says it in there, but it's a fantastic retelling of kind of just the determination he had to do. He had to have in order to become Batman. So we got, we have his college days here and we have Bruce Wayne uh, basically learning from all these professors and experts in criminology. The thing is, where is Bruce Wayne in this panel? He's actually the curly haired dude, Larry David, young Larry David looking dude uh, here because Bruce Wayne knows that none of the knowledge should ever be traced to, you know, famous billionaire scion Bruce Wayne. So, oh, so he's, disguises, he's just doing disguises already. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So he uses the disguise stuff that I, you know, later on is revealed to have been taught to him by Alfred uh, in order to sort of moonlight all of these classes and become different students just to learn from these people. And I thought, I, I remember reading this and being like, God damn, that's hardcore, but it's so in character. Mm -hmm. So uh, I love this stuff. One of my favorite takes on sort of the, the general training and stuff. So it, it's an interesting part of the training too, because it's not about, it is not about the like martial arts component so much as it is about uh, his college days, his like earlier days and stuff. And it's that's kind of cool. the in between. So uh, it's kind of a unique little chapter in there. So, uh, that's number seven, my beginning and my probable end. Number six is another cool cover I like. Yeah, that's Batman cool. 604, we're looking at uh, Batman who has been shot in the chest, and you can see the armor underneath. And I always use this as an example of, like, you don't need to have the armor on the outside. Have it underneath so that he doesn't look like he's a fucking tennis shoe. The so battle damage mind. of it, too, is so cool. Mm -hmm. You know, if, like, the suit starts to rip, like it's just like another cool toy basically as well like yeah. it's it's a missed opportunity that when they mm -hmm. you know uh don't do it that way i think yeah i think so too yeah so uh let's see we have ed brubaker in, in terms of writing pencils by scott mcdaniel colors by gregory wright inks by andy owens and letters by john costanza on this so this is this was actually introduced to me when it was collected in the batman begins comic adaptation they decided, hey, let's throw in some comics at the end. I'm like, eh, all right, I'm mainly getting this for... Um, they had another comic on the training of Batman in there, so I was mainly getting it for that, but then I got to this story and I'm like, oh, this is the best story in this entire thing. Okay. So, uh, so there's this popular conception that like Bruce Wayne died with his parents, and Bruce Wayne is just a mask, and Batman's the real person. He became Batman once his dead parents hit the ground. I'm like, okay, that's just psychologically i don't think that's that's actually believable to me and and it's been said a lot and i think this comic is the ultimate argument that bruce wayne lives so okay that's cool uh it's a comic set during the bruce wayne fugitive arc where bruce is a fugitive uh who has been you know he's, he's basically on the run for something he didn't do this is one of those things i mentioned fugitive earlier uh, it is not collected with the rest of the collection notice we don't have the title fugitive on here even though it's technically part of it it's not even collected with the rest of the story if you were to buy the trade paperbacks i don't know what the oh hell was going God. on yeah yeah but the thing is it works so well as a standalone story you don't really need to read the other parts outside of just knowing that it's set during a time where he's on the run and that's about okay it. uh story is somewhat simple it's really a character piece batman spends the issue wondering you know it's called reason so he's wondering about the reasons he became batman why he does what he does and at the same time he's on a case with catwoman and and it comes to a point where his no kill rule is questioned and Batman kind of realizes that the no kill rule doesn't necessarily come from the dark Avenger Batman. It comes from Bruce Wayne. It comes from the Bruce Wayne side of him. Oh yeah, that's good. So, uh, that's, it, it's a lot more of a character piece. It's not really a super, you know, it's not necessarily a great display, uh, you know, great display of Batman at the world's greatest detective. It's more of a display of the humanity behind it. Um, well, that's good. That's 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 an important issue, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so, and I think it's it's grossly overlooked uh, and stuff. It's a hidden gem, obviously. On mm -hmm. this. so uh, that is number six. So now, time for top five. Oh, here we go. 
Here we go. Uh, the case of the honest crook in Batman number five, 1941. I had to throw in a Bill Finger one here. Oh, yeah. So uh, Bill Finger, obviously the main father of Batman. The most significant stories, however, aren't necessarily the best ones, as we talked about beforehand. Sure, there's the first Batman story, but that, as we've talked about before, is just a ripoff of a shadow story. So <laughs> I don't really feel comfortable <laughs> listing that one, even though it is extremely significant, but it's just not. I can't really say that it was it's it's you know it has that reputation for it now you know same thing right. with the first joker story it's like eh, the first joker story still has elements from the shadow you know so we've got that this however is where we're finally divorced from the shadow I don't know if it's necessarily the first time but it's definitely the first significant stamp this to me is bill fingers masterpiece here so, okay cool uh everyone has their hot take as we talked about how batman beats up poor people but here in 1941, Batman finds a thief and is about to stop him and stops himself from beating the man when he hears his story. And he finds out that this thief is somebody who is trying to help his sick wife. He's been blackmailed by the mob. He's desperate for money in order to save her. And so it demonstrates Batman having compassion, having a sense of, of justice. It's not about taking out his rage and trauma on just anybody who breaks the law. It's about it's about learning what's just in the world and enforcing that and helping those who who are less fortunate uh so that is a big part of it but it also shows batman's rage and his fear of losing someone he cares about so he gets sort of an eerie foreshadowing of death of the family here at this point where robin is wounded and bill finger writes quote for the first time the batman knows rage bleak grim rage woe to all criminals for now the batman has become a terrible figure of vengeance so i love these this too i mean some people don't like this and uh as far as like having like a little bit of prose mm -hmm. here uh yeah. this is probably more common back in the day right and i really appreciate it that actually helps me to kind of helps me to understand what's going on sometimes too and i don't know yeah it's 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 i like the way it's written here as well yeah yeah i i do too especially because you're not you know you're you're kind of used to the noirish type stuff and the more modern stuff, you know? Yeah. But for here, it's like, oh, shit. Like, it, it feels like there's some kind of... It feels like a modern injection into the uh, the 1940s, even though really it's the opposite. Oh, it's yeah. Really just us updating what's already there. So Right, right, uh, right. So not only does it show Batman's compassion, but it also shows badass Batman. So we have Batman defeating criminals in a fight without ever getting out of a chair he's sitting in. Oh, and nice. Then, uh, it's him taking three bullet wounds and still not giving a fuck as he fights through in order to take down the men who screw who basically screwed over the honest crook and endangered Robin here. So it would be uh, cool fantastic. to see like Pattinson get fucking shot in between the armor and get Ooh, fucked yeah. up. Mm -hmm. And then Alfred has to help him pull the bullet out and shit in the next scene or some shit. Yeah, that'd be cool. See more of the scars. Yeah. Good thing he didn't shoot you in your chin, Master Wade. <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> they haven't done that. <laughs> so uh, that is number five. Number four, you should have seen him from 1988. So oh, this that, is a pretty badass cover. It's like yeah. hor horrific. Yeah. And Alex of the What Bean Podcast uses this as uh, his profile on the on the uh, oh, Patreon. Nice. So Star good choice, again. man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good choice. I like. I like this. This is a, looks like a cool Halloween issue or something. It is. Uh, it's unfortunately not. It's. Yeah, I think it's mainly because it's Todd McFarlane doing the cover here. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why. So Todd McFarlane does the cover. He does not do the interior art. That's done by Dave Cochran. But the writer is Jim Starlin. Again, the only writer of two on this list mm. uh, of hidden gems here. Because again, like the stuff that people highlight from his Batman run are not necessarily the stuff that I think is the best. Um, so there are several versions of this type of story where, you know, multiple people in Gotham share their takes on, on Batman and who he is. And we get to see different interpretations of it. There's, you know, the classic story, the Batman, nobody knows. Uh, I think the most famous one is the Bruce Tim, uh, Batman, the animated series one legends of the dark Knight, where like one person says, Oh, he's like the Dick Sprang 1940s Batman. <laughs> and then another one has the like, Oh, he's like the Frank Miller Batman. Like that one, uh, is the most okay. famous. Um, but this is the best one. Hands cool. down. I read it. I'm like, oh, this is this, you you can't top this one. <laughs> so okay, cool. It is from the perspective of the GCPD this time. So three cops sit down 
and share their encounters with Batman. And each one shows different sides of Batman. Some of it is Batman being a hero and talking a man out of suicide. Some of it is Batman being, you know, the grim vigilante of justice, of stopping criminals with brute force. You know, he Mm -hmm. threatens one guy where he's just like, I'm just going to keep coming for you again and again because I won't let you die. (laughs) And sort of uses the no kill rule as an intimidation factor, which I thought is kind of is a cool twist from Starlin's standpoint. That's interesting because they won't let him die. They won't let him commit suicide. Yeah. So uh, that, that, yeah, that type of thing where it's just like, actually me not killing you is worse than me killing you. (laughs) So (laughs) that type of stuff. That's cool. Uh, And then also the compassionate side of Batman, helping a pair of children find a home, as we've talked about beforehand in the symbol of hope episode. So um, again, this is a great, this and the previous one of the case in honest crook show just how multifaceted this character is you know if it if it was just him being a badass being the shit out of criminals for 20 pages every month i don't think i would be as attached to this character no you know i wouldn't because it'd be just john wick it exactly it'd be john wick in a bat suit and i feel like a lot yeah. of people that's what they like about batman is it being john wick in a bat suit and i'm like mm, that's not it's not my batman yeah that's just like that's why I like the superhero genre because it has this whole mix, yeah, of things. This, um, like the CW people say, uh, heart, humor, and spectacle. Yeah, that's what that's for the Definitely. Flash mainly. Probably a little mm-hmm. bit less humor in Batman, but still, you know, um, yeah. So, yeah. So that. this is uh, this this shows the different areas. Like he can be John Wick Batman for an action sequence, sure. Yeah, that's but what the we're there for. That movie. yeah, yeah. Yeah, at that so, point, yeah, it's just one uh, note. If it becomes John Wick, that's really yeah, what yeah. it boils down to. But instead, we got here. We have you know, we have the Avenger. We have the hero. We have the compassionate, you know, sort of father figure who takes these kids under his wings. We have a whole bunch of sides to this character, and each cop has seen different ones, which is why it's called "You Should Have Seen Him." Mm. So that is number four. So that's all you get for this week. That was our episode released from the Patreon vault. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you want to hear the full episode, please go to patreon.com slash superhero stuff pod. And this, the rest of this episode and a bunch more is there. It's at the $5 tier. So please check that out and we hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you later. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.